and welcome. Thank you for joining our April Blue Trail Guide monthly webinar. Um, I'm really pleased that we have so many of you here joining us today um, to learn a little bit more about marketing ecotourism and your river uh, in your community. So just a couple of quick housekeeping things before we get started. Um, this is, I'm Faye Augustine. I'm the Intermountain West Blue Trails Manager for American Rivers, um, and I'm really pleased to be moderating our April webinar this month. As always, if your connection is lost, um, please log in using your unique web link and passcode that you were provided when you registered with GoToWebinar. Um, and as always, a, a recording of this webinar um, will, it will be available um, at bluetrailsguide.org backslash webinars, um, and we are recording it. So that will be available to you as well for future use or to pass along to um, any friends or colleagues that might find this information helpful or interesting. And finally, we always encourage um, questions throughout the webinar. Um, anytime throughout the presentation, you are welcome to submit a question in the questions box on your GoToWebinar side panel. Um, we'll be able to see those questions throughout the webinar, um, and then we'll leave time at the end to answer any questions um, during our Q&A session. And if there are questions that are not able to be answered, we will be sure uh, to answer all of those questions um, after the webinar is completed. And a transcript of all questions and all answers will be available online on the Blue Trails Guide website, um, as well as a recording of this webinar by this coming Friday, April 29th. So with that, I want to introduce our um, pr uh, presenter for, for today, Ms. Natalie Warren. Um, in 2011, Natalie was one of the first of two women to paddle 2,000 miles from Minneapolis to the Hudson Bay. Um, and on that, on that expedition, she was exposed to a number of issues surrounding small town economies and societies, agriculture, industry, energy, and the environment. After she was nominated for Canoe and Kayak's 2012 Expedition of the Year, she began providing audiovisual presentations to inspire communities to experience and learn from their local rivers. In 2012, she formed the nonprofit organization Wild River Academy to present urban rivers as, natural, as a natural dynamic classroom through which she organized an 11-person expedition down the length of the entire Mississippi River. In 2015, she worked with the River Management Society to create a summary of publications about the economic benefits of water trails and began advising communities on way to increase paddle sports tourism. She currently writes for Canoe and Kayak magazine about popular amenities in river communities, shown in How to Make a River Town and her monthly series, The Next Best Paddling Town. She works currently with the St. Croix River Association on land use policy as the river corridor steward. She also was very nice and presented has presented previously on the Blue Trails Guide webinar series this past December on the webinar entitled Making an Economic Case for Water Trails. So with that, Natalie, I want to go ahead and pass it um, along to you and say thank you in advance for your presentation. Yeah, thank you. You um, just covered my first couple slides with that intro, so great job. <laughs> Uh, so this, the purpose of this webinar is to help people uh, market their communities and the paddler amenities and opportunities for tourists in the area. Just a little bit about myself. First, uh, I started paddling on wilderness rivers and I think that wilderness rivers are really beautiful and amazing, but it wasn't until I later paddled more accessible rivers by urban areas that I started to learn more about how people interact with the river and how cities interact with the river and how some waterfronts are really great and some cities you can paddle right by and never even know it was there. So in 2011, I paddled from Minneapolis to Hudson Bay, so on the Minnesota Red River, the Lake Winnipeg up to the Hayes River during a flood and I got to interact with communities and learn a lot about um, industries and agriculture along the river. 
as well as small town communities that had decreasing populations because their only industry was agriculture and with the increase in technology um, you needed few people people to help out on the farm therefore few people fewer people lived in the area From there, I paddled the Mississippi River, which was another wave of education in how communities interact with their water trail. Sometimes we were able to hop right off of the river and explore town, and other times, like I mentioned before, we passed communities that um, had turned their backs to the river. Just a couple pictures from that trip. This is across from an oil refinery where we camped. And that was our team. So the last webinar I gave was about the economic benefits of water trails. And I'd like to give a brief overview um, because that is connected with how to market your community and increase tourism based on um, collaboration and who needs to be involved, who the stakeholders are. So environmental benefits of water trails the northern forest canoe trail study does a really great job delving into research on a lot of these topics it links outdoor recreation to greater environmental awareness through experiencing the water firsthand paddlers are more likely to care about environmental issues concerning recreation areas some social benefits of water trails um, the northern forest canoe trail study also found that recreation communities have lower poverty rates and higher education and health levels. Recreational opportunities can build community pride, provide stewardship opportunities for the community, and provide a place to exercise and to connect. So the economic benefits of water trails, you can see there's a canoe there in downtown Chicago. We paddled the Chicago River to the Chicago Sanitary Canal where we were kicked off by the Coast Guard. And uh, so the economic benefits of water trails, there's still a lot that needs to be discovered, but it's a very hot topic right now. And people are extremely interested in putting a, a monetary value on paddle sports tour tourism. So in many cases, cities and towns along a water trail have untapped economic potential. And panel sports tourism has the potential to diversify economies that have historically relied on one or two industries. For example, like I was talking about before, a community that solely relies on agriculture. If you can inject paddle sports tourism in conjunction with existing industries, then that benefits the community's economic health. So many towns and urban areas have turned their backs on the waterfront due to water quality issues, fear of flooding, and dams. But today, communities are starting to envision their waterfronts as a resource to increase tourism and stabilize or grow their economy. Just a couple statistics to back that up. This is from the Outdoor Industry Association. The outdoor recreation economy generates $80 billion per year in national, state, and local tax revenues. And water sports generate over $4.8 in local and state taxes. This is a chart of visitor expenditures from the Northern Forest Canoe Trail Study. Last year, I worked on a project with the River Management Society to compile a summary of existing economic impact studies on water trails. We found that Yes, water trails can have a huge economic impact on communities, but there needs to be more consistent and, ex and more accessible ways for communities to do economic impact studies for their water trails. I found that um, the different studies measured different times and they used different jargon and it was very hard to compare them. And so I think moving forward, as more of these studies are being done, there needs to be a more consistent process we also found that between all of the studies, dining, lodging, and outfitters were the most important amenities to increasing paddle sports tourism and accounted for the majority of visitor expenditures. So you can see here on this pie chart, lodging, restaurants, and groceries, so food, and outfitters, shuttling, guide, are the three biggest components. 
The other amenities are secondary. So if you put an antique shop, you're not going to get more people coming to your water trail. But if you have the main things in place and then you add uh, a local business to that, it enhances the paddler's experience while they're in town. So I was touring around and giving presentations and talking to communities about getting new money into your economy, um, how it would flow through direct and indirect impacts, and um, just increase their tax base and all this. And the response that I got is that people knew, um, but they wanted to know what to do next. And so that kind of prompted this webinar. We all want a story that is similar to the Huron River Trail, where this article was from 2011 saying, they hope the 100 mile water trail will boost river tourism. And then you see in this study that in 2012, they made over a million dollars in boat rentals. So we're all looking for a success story like that in our community. Okay, so everybody gets it. Economic benefits of water trails. What do you do next? I think first, figuring out what makes your community unique is very important. Uh, this is a picture of me in a dog costume playing my saxophone and uh, being told to stop by a cop on a Segway. And I would say that playing saxophone and dressing up like a dog occasionally makes me unique and it's something that I share to tell my story. So marketing your community, you need to figure out how you are special and what sets you apart from other communities. When we were paddling the Mississippi River, we came across a town in uh, Montrose, Iowa, and we stopped there because the sun was going down and we needed somewhere to camp. And what we found was a really passionate community that we didn't have on the map at all, but they were so excited that we were paddling on their river and they wanted to share with us their history which is focused around the water trail. So they used to be the button making mecca on the Mississippi River where they harvested mussels to make buttons. And they have this little museum and they showed us how it was done and everybody there was just really excited about their story. So this is something that could have happened in their history and then when mussels were over harvested, they could have said, okay, well, we're just gonna move on and try to be like any other small town, but instead they truly embraced why they were unique and how that was related to the river and shared it with everyone that came through their community. Another example along the Mississippi River, this is at the River Music Experience. So in Dubuque, they have the National Mississippi River Museum, and this is in Davenport. So Davenport, instead of saying, well, we're also going to do a Mississippi River Museum, they said, well, let's think about why we're unique. Um, music has come here from New Orleans up the river historically, and so there's a really great blues scene here, and they started a museum that focuses on the migration of music up and down the Mississippi River. So at this point, once you figure out your story, which if your community is on a water trail, the water is very pivotal in your history. So figuring out the best way to communicate that to people and make sure that it's consistent between all of the stakeholders, that everybody's telling more or less the same story. At this point, you have your community that is aware of the water trail and its importance in your area. So we're gonna have a couple marketing map check-ins throughout the webinar. Telling your story. So marketing your community these days means online content, social media, and interactive media. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't be making brochures and putting them at the gas station. It just means that you should be doing both. And if you uh, do more online content, you're more likely to get an increase in visitors than if you did more paper content, just the way that people um, figure out about opportunities. This is the Huron River Water Trail website. I highly recommend checking it out. It's fairly new 
And here you can see different things to do in each town along the water trail. So the most basic way to reach people is through a thoughtful, well laid out website that is easy to access and find information. I would caution against just the checklist for marketing, which is check we have social media, check we have a website, but really looking at each of those components and figuring out how to do it well, because the difference between a bad website and a good website could be thousands of people visiting your community. So ultimately, you want someone who does not live in your community to be able to discover recreation opportunities and amenities without having to visit multiple websites. If I have to go to the city website and the outfitter website and the bed and breakfast website to piece together my trip, I'm less likely to do it because it's more work on my end. So figuring out how to do all the work for someone who might visit the area. This website does an amazing job because it shows you the businesses in the towns along the water trail and it also links to different information and has interactive videos. So videos are kind of the new hip way to get your message out there. If the first thing that people see when they come to your website is a short, nice, clear cut video about the water trail, different things to do in town, then they're going to listen and they're going to watch that more than they would read a bunch of text on your website. Text heavy websites are um, not really the best way to reach people. So this here, if you can't hear the audio, that's okay. You can see the visuals. This is a 30 second clip for Des Moines, Iowa, talking about the river opportunities and the businesses in town. So something like that paints a picture right away of what I can do in the area and what I can expect as a paddler coming into the community. So social media, of course, is very important to marketing your opportunities. It's a crucial, crucial tool to increase paddle, paddle sports tourism. The paddling club, if you have one, if you don't, you should create one and it could just be you and a friend and it will slowly grow over time, I guarantee you. Um, they can post about their favorite spot to stop in for a beer and what bed and breakfast is their favorite. They can also reach out through Facebook and Twitter to other local paddling clubs who you know are paddlers and they're looking for opportunities to paddle. So if you tweet at another paddling club that say, in a couple towns over and tell them to come paddle in your area, then you start to connect further than just paddlers in your own community. So I was in Snow Hill, Maryland in October consulting on paddle, paddle sports tourism and they didn't have a paddling group. So the community got together and made one and now they have 45 members. So it's important to do everything. Um, prioritize what you think is, is going to work, but just having Facebook and just having a website, you're missing people who are on Twitter and you're missing people who are on Instagram. And if you don't take beautiful photos and videos, then you're missing even more people. So you can take a look at all these images. You need um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all these things in conjunction will help you market your opportunities online and reach a more searchable point for either your organization or your city. So marketing map check-in at this point, after your um, community is working hard to market through all those avenues we just talked about, then your community and some of the world, if they go looking for those opportunities, will find them. Or if you find those people, then they will know about them. So you're still missing all the people who aren't looking for it and you don't know how to reach them. It's really important to collaborate with diverse stakeholders in the community. 
So hardworking nonprofits and government agencies and outfitters desperately try to market their water trail without the full force of their community, and it could be much easier than they're making it for themselves. Without involving others in the trail, it's harder to convince local businesses and residents to truly invest in their water trail. Shared ownership can make all the difference in this situation when it comes to community pride, funding for events, and stewardship opportunities. So the economic benefits of water trails, there's enough information out there where you can take that research and bring it to people to show them the benefits in their community and why they should get involved in the future of the water trail. So as advocates, use that existing research to involve new people who might not see how they're affected by the water trail. So for example, you can show the gas station owner how much money on average people visiting a comparable water trail spend on gas when they come to a town to recreate and invite them to join a focus group or a community meeting to discuss the future of the water trail so that they can have some skin in the game. Um, maybe they'll even want to provide life jackets or water jugs and provide paddling brochures at their gas station once they see the connection between the water trail and their business. So you can use the information out there to get people involved and keep them involved, which is the important part, in community decision making about your local trail economy. This is an example of the Bed and Breakfast Association in Snow Hill posting about the water trail. So once you get these businesses involved, they can market for you and you don't have to carry the burden of marketing the water trail all by yourself. So marketing for each other and providing shared resources can also foster community pride around the water trail and increase tourism, not just for the water trail, but also for the bed and breakfast. So it's a two way street. If the water trail organization says paddle here today and sleep at this bed and breakfast tonight and the bed and breakfast says sleep here tonight and paddle here today. Um, then you are helping each other reach a whole new market. So at this point, the new people in our marketing check-in are people who aren't looking exactly for that information, but they're coming across it through different avenues, whether they're on TripAdvisor and they're looking at a lodging place or they're on Yelp and they're looking at somewhere to eat and they go to the website and a local restaurant will talk about the river, you're starting to creep into other avenues of communication. This is a map of the Raccoon River Valley Trail. It's a bike trail and you can see here it's not just focused on one community but several communities working together to increase tourism. Historically, cities and towns have been competitive with each other to bring more tourists in and basically have bragging rights on which town is the cooler town. But it's, I think, time to move beyond that and start to see the bigger picture. So if you take a step back, when people are visiting your town or your city, they're likely visiting places around there as well. So start to think countywide, regionwide, statewide, whatever it takes to really make those boundaries disappear and understand that you're all working together collaboratively to bring more people to the area. Um, tourism groups in neighboring areas should work together to outline shared amenities and tourism opportunities in that region as a whole. Concerning communities along the water trail, if one community has a brewery, then maybe the other community should prioritize a bed and breakfast or an independent coffee shop and start seeing amenities as shared resources across the region rather than just going through the checklist for each community. I need a coffee shop, I need a brewery, I need this, I need that. So as a paddler visiting the area, I want to paddle from one town to the next and experience different amenities, not the same in every town. Um, this is so using the Snow Hill example again, instead of just zooming in on Snow Hill and talking about what to do there, thinking about uh, building itineraries for people. So if you're in Snow Hill, stay at the bed and breakfast, but there's this really great coffee shop in Ocean City, and from there you can rent a bike and you can 
bike to Salisbury for lunch and then come back to Pocomoke City and then you can paddle back to Snow Hill. So piecing all of those itineraries together, whether it's a one day, two day, three day opportunity for people will basically do the work for people visiting your community and they are more likely to follow a put together itinerary of the best of your region than they are to go to each individual websites for each outfitter and tourism group and restaurants to try to piece something like this together for an area that they're not familiar with. So once you have that, there's this really amazing opportunity to share your story. So don't wait around for some magazine or blog to discover your community and be inspired to write an article about how awesome the recreation opportunities are in your town. Um, because it could happen, but really the people who are writing these were probably approached by communities who are constantly doing marketing and outreach about the opportunities in their area. So I'd say find someone in your community who can write well and have them write um, about all of these itineraries that I discussed before. And if you send editors a well-written and edited piece, that is within their scope and also has great pictures, then it's really hard for an editor who's trying to meet a deadline to turn something like that down. So canoe and kayak, best paddling towns. I write the series, The Next Best Paddling Towns for Canoe and Kayak magazine. And if you feel like those are big fish to fry, then you can also look, there's a whole spectrum of uh, media that's talking about these things. So paddling.net, instead of paying for an advertisement to, you know, for one second, hope that somebody sees something about your community, write a really great article about your community and send it to them with pictures. And maybe it's something that they will feature and you'll reach even more people for way less money. From here, you can start thinking out of the box too. Frame everything in your community around the water trail. So um, bed and breakfast magazines, restaurant magazines, blogs, anything can be um, communicated within the scope of the water trail. So, oh, go here for dinner after a day on the water. Stay here overnight if you're paddling from one community to the next. So really get sneaky to figure out how to incorporate your water trail into everything else that's going around. And then from there, if you're in an international magazine, whether it's just a sentence about your water trail featuring something else in your community, you're reaching hundreds of thousands of people across the world. And so I'm currently planning a trip to New Zealand and all I do is go online and I say best paddling places in New Zealand and whatever comes up is what I'm going to look into. So start to think about your community as a place that people are going to come to. They don't need, they don't know anything about yet, but if they look online, they're able to find enough information to piece together their trip. Uh, it's also important to say that uh, every trail town is really different. So there's really no cookie cutter, cookie, cookie cutter answer to become a successful river town and to increase paddle sports tourism. But I think the main point here is that community collaboration, shared resources and marketing and online interactive media can be applied to any trail to effectively increase paddle sports tourism because together collaborative stakeholders can bring light to a growing economic resource, which is our nation's water trails. Awesome. Thank you so much, Natalie, for taking the time um, to chat with us today and give your excellent presentation on um, marketing your community and your river. Um, we've got, it's just about 11.30, so we may have time for one question. Um, we've got a couple in the question box already, so if you have any kind of final burning questions, um, we likely won't have time to get to them today, but we will have them um, available on the Blue Trails Guide website in transcript form by this coming Friday, April 29th. Um, but Natalie, the one quick question we do have um, 
we do have time for is, do you have suggestions for ways um, to kind of start some of these conversations with businesses or with the Chamber of Commerce um, when communities are starting to look towards marketing um, their marketing their water trail and really getting the business community involved? Yeah, so I think what has worked for a lot of groups is not talking about the flowery anecdotal side of the water trail. Um, even though you may love the wildlife and the fishing opportunities and how remote it feels when you're on the trail, I find that if you use concrete statistics and numbers, and I mean, if you don't have an economic impact study for your water trail, which not a lot of communities do, use the ones that are in existence and figure out which one is most comparable to your community and use that as um, your the focus of your conversation saying, look, this community was here 10 years ago and they're here now because of this and this is what they've done and this is how much economic impact um, their water trail has had. And then from there, I think you really get a bipartisan involvement of people on the city council listening and looking at diversifying their economy and bettering the health of their community rather than disregarding a, a different approach which might be more of the environmental hippie side of things. So I, I'd say use the numbers that are out there, use the research that is out there to craft your argument for the economic benefits of these wonderful natural resources. Excellent. Thanks so much, Natalie. Um, and with that, it's just after 11.30, so as I mentioned, we'll have a full transcript available on the Blue Child Guide webinar, as well as the recorded version of this webinar this Friday, April 29th. Um, so thank you all for taking time out of your Tuesday to join us. Um, and Natalie, a big thank you to you uh, for taking the time to present to us today. I know um, that I learned a lot um, and look forward to kind of continuing to follow your work in the future. Um, and I invite all of you to participate with us next month on Tuesday, May 31st for our May monthly webinar where we'll be learning more about ways to um, engage diverse stakeholder groups in creating um, recreation plans and conservation plans. So look for more information on that in the upcoming um, days, and I look forward to uh, seeing and chatting with you all then. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, guys.